Alrighty. So let's uh, take our Bibles now and come to Romans uh, chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'd like to try to finish the chapter this week and then take the next couple of weeks uh, to uh, close out Romans chapter 16, uh, at least by Christmas time, because that way when we come back from uh, the Christmas break, because obviously there will be some life breaks uh, right around Christmas and New Year's, uh, I'd like for us to uh, start a new book uh, coming back. Uh, what do y'all think about the book of Jonah? I've been thinking about maybe doing the book of Jonah. It's kind of a, a, a short book. It's got four chapters, but it's, uh, it's rich with uh, applications that are uh, pertinent to us, uh, you know, as far as uh, even in the New Testament. And so uh, I'm thinking about that. I haven't made a final decision, uh, but uh, uh, we definitely need to start thinking about what we're going to do after Romans because uh, Romans is uh, rapidly coming to a close here. Well, I don't know. Maybe rapidly is not the right word. I was right going to say, not rapidly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, nothing goes rapidly with me. <laughs> James is a good book too. Yeah, James, James is a really good book too. James is a good book. Well, what I was thinking, what I was trying to think about, was like just trying to alternate a little bit, like we're finishing up a New Testament book. Mm-hmm. Do something from the Old Testament, and like I said, uh, Jonah is, is pretty short. It's only four chapters, right. um, and so you know, four to six weeks, because the chapters aren't that long. I, right. uh, so maybe a four to six week series in Jonah. And then come back to the New Testament and, you know, possibly James or, or something like that. At some point, I want to do Revelation. I, I, I love teaching Revelation. Ooh, that's that's going to take a year. Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. Well, we've been in Romans for over a year. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. You'd have to go back and look at the, uh, yeah. uh, at the YouTube channel uh, as that's far as the dates funny. of the videos. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Romans is one of those books. You get sidetracked. If you're going to go through it, you, you need to go through it. You're, you know, uh, you're not just going to go through Romans uh, flippantly and, and, and casually and get through it in uh, you know, three or four weeks. So, <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 15. Now, we left off last week at uh, verse number 8, Romans 15, 8. Uh, he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Now, what this is referring to, Jesus being a minister of the circumcision, circumcision, of course, is the Jews, and what this is a reference to was his three-and-a-half-year earthly ministry. It doesn't mean that now, in the grand scheme of things, that Jesus' only ministry is the circumcision, the Jews. It's talking about how that when he walked this earth and had that ministry from the age of 30 to 33-and-a-half years old, that his primary focus was on the nation of Israel. And so um, when you go through the Gospels, you you find uh, a constant emphasis on Israel, and then you find hints here and there that the Gospel is not just for Israel, that it's going to be for the whole world. But that revelation in the Gospels, as you're walking through the Gospels, that hasn't been revealed yet. It's not until you get to the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is going to open things up and help us all understand that the gospel is not to the Jew only, it's to the Jew and the Gentile. It's to the Jew first, however. You remember Romans chapter 1, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Well, in the gospel, that part, and also to the Greek, that's not revealed yet. Now, uh, look back at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And I think I showed you this last week, but, uh, you know, just by way of review here. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus has called the 12 apostles. And after he's uh, finished naming uh, these apostles, um, he says, verse 5, verse 5. Matthew 10, 5. These 12, why did he choose 12? Twelve tribes of Israel, right? So twelve apostles to match twelve tribes. The number twelve in the scripture is always associated with the number of Israel. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. So he specifically prohibits them going to the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But rather, verse 6, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when he chooses the twelve... He commissions them, and their commission prohibits them from going to the Gentiles, but specifically commands them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so Paul says Jesus was a minister of the circumcision because during his first advent in his earthly ministry, 
His concentration on, was on calling Israel to repentance. Now, of course, uh, Israel ends up rejecting him as the Messiah and having him crucified. Now, even though the emphasis was on the Jews, there were still hints in the gospel that it was going to come to us as Gentiles also. Look at John. Come to uh, John chapter 10. You were in Matthew 10, now come to John 10. John chapter 10. Let's see. Y'all help me out. I'm looking for the 22, verse. 22 maybe? Uh, the verse. unbelief of the Jews? I'm looking where he says, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. And I'm looking at my text and I'm not seeing it. 16. Is it 16? Mm -hmm. There we go. All right, let's, let's come back a few uh, 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 verses to get context. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now watch verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And so the other sheep that he speaks of here is talking about you and I, the Gentiles. And so even though his commission was to the nation of Israel, here we see one of several hints that the gospel is going to be for us as well. You're in John 10. Look over at John 12. John 12. Uh, come to verse uh, 20. John chapter 12, look at verse 20. The Bible says here, uh, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh to tell of Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so notice that there are Greeks or Gentiles, and now they've come seeking Jesus. Uh, last week we spoke of the uh, Syrophoenician woman in the Gospel of Mark. You know, uh, how she came to Jesus desiring to have her daughter uh, healed. Uh, and Jesus said, it's not me to cast the children's bread to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, but the children eat of the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And he said, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. For this saying, go thy way, thy daughter is healed. And so uh, that Syrophoenician woman, she was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. And so he, he tells her, look, it's not appropriate. It's not uh, kosher. It's not a good thing to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. You know, we kind of joked last week that if Jesus said that today, she'd probably file a lawsuit against him for calling her a dog. <laughs> Where is that? Uh, that's in uh, the Gospel of Mark. And uh, right off the top of my head, uh, I, I don't have uh, the address for that, but it's in the Gospel of Mark. Okay. And so uh, I, I'll get you the address for that. It's just a miracle of the Syrophoenician woman. Yeah, I don't have uh, don't the, the, that mark. the reference written down here. You don't know I don't know the reference, but if you just Google miracle Syrophoenician woman. Wait a minute. All right, so let's come back to Romans uh, chapter 15. In Romans 15, therefore, he says, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Now, again, it's not till you get to the book of Acts. Uh, can someone uh, pull up uh, Acts 1 8 and read Acts 1 8 for me? Acts 1 8. It's Mark 5 21. Yeah, I think that's what you're talking about. Read, read, it out, uh, read it out loud, Becky, if you've got it. When Jesus again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was at the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus, fell to feet and pleaded oh, earnestly, right. my little daughter. No, that's, no, yeah, that's not it. A large yeah. crowd followed around him. Read it all. Oh, no. Acts 1 8? Yeah. Read it out loud if you got it. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. All 
All right, so we've said before that Acts is what we call a transitional book. Does anyone remember what a transitional book is? There's three of them. There's Matthew, there's Acts, and there's Hebrews, which, doctrinally speaking, are the three most difficult books in the Bible and the New Testament to understand, and they're the three most difficult books in the New Testament to teach. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. All right, so a transitional book is a bridge. It brings you from one place and carries you to another so that the place you end up is not the place where you started. So Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. So Matthew is a bridge that carries you out of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Now watch this. When does the New Testament begin? When is the New Testament officially in force? Matthew chapter 27. Because in Hebrews chapter 9, the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul for what it's worth, so some folks disagree with that, which is fine. But in Hebrews 9, the writer says that a testament is a force after men are dead. Else it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Paul, do you have a will? Who's the beneficiary of your will? Good thing you said that. <laughs> it's not me? Come on, you're my number one groupie. I thought that I'd at least be the beneficiary of your will, Paul. Man. <laughs> Paul's like, yeah, I love you, but I don't love you that much. <laughs> all right, now watch this. So in your will, I'm assuming that if, when you pass, she gets everything, right? Unless your joke gets fulfilled, and then, you know, you know, you know, you know that's what work. I didn't hear the joke. <laughs> <laughs> so is that will of any power right now? Why not? I'm not dead. You're not dead. <laughs> Yet. You're still alive. Close to it. Yeah, he's as close to it. As okay. they say, now one foot in the grave and the other foot on the banana peel, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but when and if he passes, and hopefully Jesus comes first, but if he passes, then that will, that last will and testament, is now in force and in power and completely applicable to his wife, the beneficiary. All right? So, the New Testament is the same thing. Jesus doesn't die until Matthew chapter 27. So Matthew chapter 1 through Matthew chapter 26 takes place under the Old Testament. You're under the law. That's why when you're studying the Gospels, you've got to be careful about what you apply to yourself as a New Testament Christian in the church under grace because most of what is written in the Gospels is written under the law. You look at John the Baptist as a New Testament figure because he shows up in the Gospels. But John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. Last Old Testament prophet. Yeah, they lived under the law, correct? Yes. We they, live under grace. We live under grace. That's exactly right. That's why during the Gospels, the disciples are bearded, pork-abstaining, Sabbath-observing, synagogue-attending, Torah-observing Jews. And the, and the Old Testament for preaching. New Testament for teaching. Well, some, some but both of them, you know, that, that can be interchangeable as far as that aspect. You know, both are good for preaching, both are good for teaching. But here, here's the, the, the thing, is all the Bible is written for me as far as my understanding, my edification, and so forth. Not all the Bible is written to me as far as being addressed to me for specific application. And you always have to understand that as far as rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it's profitable. All of it's necessary. All of it's divinely given. All of it should be read and learned and studied. We talked last week about this fellow, uh, you know, uh, Andy Stanley, and how he's saying that Christians need to unhitch themselves from the Old Testament. Uh, no, we need to unhitch ourselves from false teachers like Andy Stanley. Because the word of God is is, is, is the final authority, not any preacher, be they a celebrity preacher or not. Is he, I, really, is he related to John Charles? Uh, it's Charles' son. 
really? Yeah, if you go back and watch the video for last week, I don't want to get into that all again. Yeah, here. But we read the article and covered all the stuff that uh, Amy Stanley was saying as far as why Christians should unhitch themselves from the Old Testament. No, we shouldn't. No. Uh, we're about to read a portion here in Romans where Paul's quoting one Old Testament scripture from another, mm-hmm. right after another. If you unhitch yourself from the Old Testament, how will you understand anything Paul's saying to you in the New Testament when he's quoting to you the Old Testament? Amen. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? So um, it, it, as far as uh, uh, application, though, we understand that um, when Jesus dies on the cross, he's now dead. The Testament is a force. And so, for example, you know, the Church of Christ, they'll tell you, uh, if you try to uh, tell them that baptism is not part of salvation, uh, you will often give them, you know, um, <clears throat> the um, uh, illustration of the dying thief and how the dying thief believed on Christ, but yet he wasn't baptized. And, and, and they will tell you, well, yes, but that's the Old Testament. No, that's not the Old Testament because Jesus died before the dying thief. So since Christ died first, which testament does that uh, a dying thief die under? He dies under the New Testament because the testator has died and the testament is now in force. Verily, verily, I say to thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And he was. Okay? So, um, but as far as uh, uh, the gospel goes, when you get to the book of Acts, uh, Jesus has risen again. He's commissioned his apostles once again and he's ascended back to the Father. And so when Acts takes place, you've got three divisions in Acts. And he says there in uh, chapter 1, verse 8, it gives you an outline of the whole book. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the divisions of the book of Acts. Because (coughs) chapters 1 through 7 take place in Jerusalem and Judea. Chapter 8, the gospel spreads to Samaria. And then in chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus gets saved, who becomes the Apostle Paul, and it spreads to the rest of the known world as far as the uttermost parts of the earth. But you'll notice that there's a transition because Matthew was a transitional book that brought you out of the Old Testament into the New. So now, at the end of Matthew, you're in the New Testament. And, you know, uh, you know uh, Mark, Luke, and John basically tell the same story, right? Just different details. <clears throat> you get to the book of Acts. Acts is another bridge that's going to take us from where we were, and when Acts ends, we are in a different place than when we started. Because over here, at this point in time, every believer is a Jew. Every believer. The only Gentile believers here are those Gentiles who had previously converted to Judaism and had become Jewish proselytes, and now as Jewish proselytes like other Jews, they have now embraced Jesus as Messiah. Right? And so there's a, a an exclusively Jewish church. And so nobody right here, chapters 1 through 7, has any idea that a Gentile like you and I can even be saved. And if you would have asked them at this point in time, they would have told you that no, Gentiles like us, the gospel is not for them. It's only for Israel. Well, in Acts chapter 8, a strange thing happens. Philip goes down to Samaria, and revival breaks out. And the Samaritans start getting saved. Who remembers who the Samaritans are? They're half-breeds. They're mixed. Yeah. Mixed-breed Jews, Jews, right? Jews and non-Jews. So if you remember, during the Babylonian captivity, you know, the Jews go into uh, captivity around 586 B.C. or thereabouts with Nebuchadnezzar. They're in captivity for 70 years, and then after that, they come back into the land and what we call the Second Temple period or the Intertestamental period, uh, right around 400 years long, roughly. Uh, they've intermingled with other races, primarily Babylonians and so forth, and they've produced basically what's a half-breed race of Samaritans. And the Jews are very racist, uh, very prejudiced, very bigoted against these Samaritans. They're not pure Jews. We we despise them. We hate them. That's why uh, the disciples marveled so much when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Uh, they're marveling that Jesus 
went through Samaria to get to Galilee because no self-respecting Jew would ever go through Samaria. They would always go around Samaria to avoid it. But Jesus goes right through there and stops. You know why? Jesus was on mission. He was on mission. And he was on mission for one person. He was, on, he was looking for one lady. And you know what? He found her. Because that's what the Savior does. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jesus leaves the 99 to go find the one. And that one, that, that one ends up bringing many. Yeah, and, and that's right. And the one, she ends up bringing many. But in Acts 8, the gospel goes to Samaria, and these so-called half-breeds, mixed-breeds that the Jews can't stand, all of a sudden, they get saved. And then after that, in Acts chapter 9, probably the most important conversion of the New Testament, Saul of Tarsus who you better know as the Apostle Paul. He gets saved. Then, in the very next chapter, chapter 10, 10, by the way, is the number of the Gentiles in Scripture, if you didn't know that. In Acts chapter 10, the first outright Gentile, Cornelius, gets saved. And not just Cornelius, but his entire household at the preaching of Peter. And so, <clears throat> and if you read Acts chapter 11, what happens to Peter? Peter gets in trouble with the Jews. You went into those that are not circumcised and didn't eat with them. And then Peter rehearses what God had allowed to transpire. And then the Jews acknowledge, well then, God has granted unto the Gentiles also repentance unto life. Right? So the pivotal chapter is Acts chapter 10. Now beginning here in 8, but especially in 10, that's where your transition starts. Because in the book of Acts, you started over here, right? All Jews, Gentiles can't be saved. But now we're going over the bridge. And Acts is taking us to the other side. And we get to the other side. The gospel has gone to the uttermost parts of the earth. And before it's over with, the church is predominantly what? Gentile. Then you have Paul's epistles, Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and going down through the epistles. All of those are addressed to Gentile believers, like you and I. Then you come to Philemon. What's the story of Philemon? The story of Philemon is a runaway slave returning to his master. A servant who had fled in rebellion. And understand, I know we have... Uh, negative connotations and rightly so of slavery here in America because of our own history of slavery of how things took place in this country understand that slavery in those times was not the same <clears throat> as what it was then very often someone would sell themselves into slavery because they had debts they could not pay um, slavery uh, was was very rarely a permanent thing it was normally uh, it was almost like a military contract enlisting in the military for X amount of years and at the end of that time you, you you had to be set free. So when I say slave, we're not talking about someone in shackles uh, being coerced into forced labor the way it took place in this country. Mm -hmm. We're talking about something that was a common part of society that very often someone, because of debts and so forth, they would put themselves in that position to pay off their debts and so forth. But the, the story is, you could almost think of Onesimus as a soldier who's gone AWOL. In the Navy, we would call it UA, unauthorized absence. And so you're not at your appointed place of duty. You have left without permission. You are not where you were supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do. And so Onesimus has left his master and has gone off in rebellion, but along the way comes in contact with a fellow by the name of Paul in prison. And Paul witnesses to him, wins him to Christ, finds out, oh yeah, Philemon, I know him. Let me write a letter on your behalf, Onesimus. And so Paul, you know, writes a letter back to Onesimus that whether he's wronged you or not, he's now your brother in Christ. Receive him as you would receive me. And you know what I've done for you, Philemon. I led you to Christ too. So you receive Onesimus the same way you uh, <clears throat> receive me. And if he's done anything uh, uh, that's wrong or owes you anything, uh, I, I raise my hand as Paul the Apostle, and I tell you, lay it to my account. I'll pay for it if there's, if there's any debt that must be paid. And, but I also remind you the debt that you have to me 
as your spiritual father in Christ who won you to the Lord. Right? So that's kind of like a synopsis of Philemon. Why is Philemon the place where it is? What's the next book after Philemon? Hebrews. So watch this. The runaway master, or excuse me, the runaway servant is coming back to his master again. The bridge that brought us from the Jew to the Gentile is now about to take us from the Gentile back to the Jew. Because the next book after Philemon is Hebrews. And from Hebrews all the way through to Revelation, the culmination of all things, you find God once again dealing with Israel. And that's why the doctrine applications, doctrinal applications of Hebrews through Jude has a Jewish flavor that Paul's epistles don't have. Because beginning with Hebrews, you're, you're in what's called the general epistles. Mm -hmm. Right? And they're general because they're not exclusively for the church. They're primarily aimed at the Jews, and they're aimed at the Jews in a time that's called Jacob's trouble or the tribulation. And there are applications for the church to be had but the primary emphasis has returned to Jew, the Jews because Hebrews has transitioned us back again. Okay, And then you get to Revelation. Revelation, that's for everybody. And that shows us the culmination of all things and how, how these things are going to end up. And so Acts is a very important book. So you start off with Jews. You ship to Samaritans. And then you end up over here primarily with Gentiles. Your primary person is Peter with a little bit of John. Then you transition to Philip. And then after that, it's mostly Paul. You got a little bit of Peter at the beginning. But for the most part, it becomes Paul's book after Acts chapter 10. And so, a transition. And so, we come back to the book of Romans. And he says, verse, uh, verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Now that's uh, 2 Samuel uh, 22, 50. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. That's uh, Deuteronomy 32, 43. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And so you'll find that in Psalm 117.1. And I'll get you these references after class if, if I'm going too fast. Um, and again, Isaiah saith, or Isaiah, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. That's Isaiah 11.10. And so notice, uh, 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 it's almost like with machine gun velocity here, that Paul starts rattling off you know, all these Old Testament prophecies. And so here's the thing. <coughs> <clears throat> in the Old Testament God had revealed that he was going to save the Gentiles matter of fact if we do look at the book of Jonah in, 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 in the new year one of the grandest themes of the book of Jonah is God sending a Hebrew prophet to preach to a Gentile king in a city and not just any Gentiles Gentiles that were Israel's most deadly enemy it'd be like you and I going to preach the gospel to ISIS or Al Qaeda before you get too uh, wrapped around the axle about, uh, well, Jonah should have obeyed and should, Jonah should have listened. And yeah, uh, if, if God called you as a missionary to go to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or the Taliban, I don't reckon you'd be too excited about that either, would you? <laughs> I know that I would. Yeah. And I hope he's not going to, you know, uh, here, here I'm saying, you know, John, I'm going to call you that. <laughs> I like being right here. John, our ladies do lunch, or let's do lunch. Um, it was Patty Center's daughter who's in Afghan. Um, Syria. You know, is it Syria? Syria? Yeah, and how dangerous <laughs> that oh, is yeah. over there for a woman. And, you know, she just lost, they just lost their son. Yeah, so, that, that, that is a dangerous place for, in Syria. You know. There's a civil war going on there right now. Yep, yep. And of course, it's but dangerous. Anyway. For, it's dangerous for any Christian in a, in a Muslim country. Yes. What, what would be the difference in, if you can call an Orthodox Jew before Jesus came, and an Orthodox Jew today? Um, 
not, not, really. not a whole lot of different. I, I, I mean, they, they still observe the same mm -hmm. uh, customs and, and so forth. Obviously, you know, uh, uh, some things are more modernized now, but you know, um, you know, the Orthodox Jews of today would, would be very similar to the Pharisees, you know, uh, of the Old Testament. And so uh, they, they still uh, have not acknowledged Christ as, as, as Messiah. And then one other question. I read something where Jesus was in the synagogue and spoke, but he wasn't in the pulpit, right? Well, you know, uh, in, in essence, uh, you know, uh, what you would consider a pulpit, yeah, he was. He, what? No, well, he was. What they disliked him. Why would they allow him to take the pulpit? Well, you know, they still regarded him as a rabbi, which was a you know a, a master or a teacher, and so um, and you know where you find him in the synagogue, that wasn't in Jerusalem, that was in Nazareth, his hometown, where he was he was well known, um, and, and so that wasn't. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the same as the Pharisees at the temple in, in Jerusalem, you know. And so, uh, but yeah, he was still, that's why throughout the Gospels you'll hear him referred to as rabbi, master, teacher. You know, uh, uh, clearly, you know, uh, you didn't have to listen to him very long to figure out that he was, yeah. you know, very skilled, you know. Uh, but but you know, I was God. thinking that was from his following, not, not the Pharisees and the no, no, and it was a it was a common thing uh, if you went into a synagogue as a uh, as a guest uh, to be asked to speak. You find in uh, Acts chapter thirteen, uh, you know, when Paul and Barnabas are on their missionary journey, they go into the synagogue, um, and you know, uh, Paul, uh, the the leader of the synagogue says, "If you men have anything or any exhortation for the people, then then speak on." So uh, it, it was a common thing to allow uh, guests or itinerant uh, uh, you know ministers or or teachers or rabbis. Uh, to be able to speak. So um, in, in verse uh, you know, 9 to 12, you know, the main thing I want to point out here is the fact that, that Paul is <coughs> using Old Testament scripture to illustrate how the gospel was going to be for the Gentiles also. Now, in writing to the Romans, who's Paul writing to? He's writing to Gentiles for the most part, but there was a strong contingency of Jews that were at Rome. And remember that as he's writing this letter, this is a group of people he's never met. These are not his personal acquaintances. These are not people that he knows. These are people that he's heard about, and so he's written this letter to encourage them. Whereas when you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you read Philippians, mm -hmm. Thessalonians, those are churches he actually started, and he knew those people personally. So he was writing to his friends as well as his brothers and sisters in Christ. And, uh, yes. And, and uh, what I noticed in it, when he's writing, he said, I, Paul, an apostle to Jesus Christ, to each one of those churches. <coughs> and to know that he had not seen, had, uh, he's not met them all, but he was writing according to Yes, yeah. It, it, he, he, certain books he will stress his apostleship, other books he, he stresses. Uh, his uh, his servanthood, you know, uh, he writes the Corinthians. He stresses his apostleship. Yeah. Why? Because that was a messed up church, <laughs> and so Paul says, hey, "I need to emphasize some apostolic authority here." You know, whereas when he writes the Philippians, he doesn't refer to himself as an apostle because those are his dear close friends. He knows they're going to listen to what he has to say, and he doesn't need to pull the apostle card, you know, uh, uh, so to speak. You know, and so uh, at any rate, um, um, so. Uh, Nine to twelve, we're reminded of the fact that you know God did foretell in the Old Testament prophecies uh, that He would uh, uh, save the Gentiles also. And uh, again, not to be a, uh, a dead horse or a, a broken clock, but you know this is why I reject you know what we talked about last week as far as Andy Stanley saying that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Uh, not when New Testament authors are using the Old Testament to build their case. How can I even understand what Paul's talking about here? If I don't have a, a, at least somewhat of an acquaintance and understanding, you know, of the Old Testament. And moving on, verse thirteen, he says, "Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost." Now I underlined, I underlined and highlighted th these words, "the God of hope." Aren't you glad that we have a God of hope? Now, with regards to hope, uh, look back at, uh, you're in Romans, uh, come back to uh, chapter 8. I made a note of source. The source. Yes, he's, the, yeah, that's great. That's, I mean, that's yeah, just Yeah, absolutely. Way. He's the source of hope. Without him, we would have no hope. Look at uh, Romans chapter 8 and look at verse uh, 24 and 25. 
24 and 25. He says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not uh, that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And so it's kind of like faith. You know, in Hebrews 11, 1, it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Believing in something, even though you can't uh, see it. And so that's kind of where we are, uh, you know, as far as uh, hope. We, we have hope even though we've never seen Christ. We have hope even though we've never seen God. Yes, sir. We also we also speak, uh, you know, um, until I had to go over to understand it. He said without hope, um, without faith, it's impossible to please. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, and that's a key part of that passage is that without faith, you, you know, you can't please him. It's impossible to please him. Now, it, it, as far as hope, um, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, um, as far as hope, you know, Becky points out uh, that God is the source of our hope. But notice also in uh, Romans 8, 24, it says we are saved by hope. So this is a saving hope. So it, it, it's kind of like this. Um, the uh, Christmas at first is coming up. When is it? Uh, the 12th, 13th, and 14th, or 13th, 14th, and 15th? Yeah, there you go. All right, so watch this. Um we're leaving for Cincinnati on the 15th. And so uh, if we're going to go to first uh, uh, Christmas at first, it's going to have to be the 13th or the 14th. It's going to have to be Friday or Saturday. It can't be Sunday because that's our party. No, it's not. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it's someone like restraint. <laughs> yeah. so, so here's the thing. Sorry. I hope, I hope to go to Christmas at first. On Friday or Saturday, I hope so. Do I know I'm going? No, I, I hope to. If, if if everything works out, you know, don't have to work late. None of the kids are in the hospital. You know, car doesn't break down. You know, we don't get a massive snowstorm between now and then that causes the whole thing to get canceled because of bad weather. So, I hope to go to Christmas at first, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to. That's not the kind of hope that I'm trusting to go to heaven. That's right. I have the hope of eternal life, mm -hmm. but it's a steadfast hope. It's a sure hope. Look over at uh, Hebrews uh, uh, chapter Amen. six. No so. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there's I hope so, which means I don't know for sure. And then there's I know so. This is I know so hope right here. Look over Hebrews 6. Wouldn't you say there's a big, big difference between spiritual and physical when we talk about hope? I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. Well, you, you're talking about something that's physical going to a, a, you know, a concert. Okay, yeah, okay. I, yeah. It's a real life, but, but we know we're going to heaven. And right. Least, yeah, I, I see what you mean now. Yeah, sure. Um, look at uh, Hebrews 6. Um, look at verse uh, 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, immutability means unchanging, God doesn't change, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope, the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Michael, you're a Navy man. Why does a ship cast its anchor? So you can stop moving. You can stop <laughs> moving. Yeah, there you go. You don't want to go adrift. Exactly. And so what's the anchor do? Holds you in place, right? Okay. Grabs that ground. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that uh, uh, within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, two immutable things. All right, here's the two immutable things. One, God can't lie. And two, he confirmed it by an oath. And I guess you might say the oath first. Because we're talking about the two things. One, God confirmed it by an oath, so God gave a promise. The second immutable thing, God can't lie. So again, immutable means unchanging. So God gave an oath. The oath isn't going to change. God can't lie. 
That's not going to change. And so those two unmovable things are the anchor of our soul that's steadfast in sure. And whereas I cannot tell you for sure 100% that I'm going to Christmas at first in December, I can tell you 100% that both I and anyone else who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ, I can tell you with 110% assurance that they're going to heaven when they leave this world. That's the difference between I hope so kind of hope and I know so kind of hope. And so uh, when, when the Bible here, Romans 15, calls him the God of hope, it's because he's the source of hope. It's a saving hope. It's a sure hope. And it's a steadfast hope. And steadfast, again, means unmovable. Um, notice uh, uh, Titus. I always like Titus chapter uh, 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I went too far. I'm all the way there. Titus chapter 2. Verse Start at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I'll look at verse 13. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And so verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope. That blessed hope is a person. That blessed hope is a person. Who's the person? Jesus Christ. The great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to one of things verses there. What's that? A one of you familiar? Oh yeah, Awana? yeah, yeah. Let's go to one of things verses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, a one is a great program. I, I went to a one as a kid uh, back in uh, West Virginia, growing up, and then later in life as an adult, I was a an Awana uh, teacher, leader, whatever the uh, whatever yeah, the title is. All right, so uh, Jesus is that blessed hope. And so uh, Romans uh, 15, 13, the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace in believing. So the hope that we have, what does it do? It brings joy and it brings peace. Why? Because we believe in what God says. Now, does that mean that we're never going to have trials and tribulations, hard times, heartaches, and so forth? Of course not. You know, uh, uh, every day you hear about uh, uh, different believers going through different hardships and trials. You know, uh, Mark shared a little bit with his daughter. You know, uh, or, you know, earlier today, uh, Pastor Eric. Uh, you know, in his message this morning, uh, you know, talked about going through hardships and things like that. You know, you guys are are well familiar with uh, with Amy and I as far as our family dynamic with our kids. And you've had your own sorrows. You've had your own issues that you've had to go through. And so, uh, God never promised us a bed of roses. Never promised us a bed of roses. Yes. Um, and God, you know, um, I had to learn that a tough way. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as a Christian, <coughs> I learned that if I'm going to identify with my father, which is the, um, Jesus, um, he suffered. Yes. So if my father suffered and I honor him, then I don't have to suffer. Right. He said, Suffer me to fulfill all righteousness. And had he not, then I don't think I would. That's my belief. No, you're, you're exactly right. And, 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 and God says that all they that, uh, 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 all they that uh, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, uh, it, it's called upon us to suffer with him if we're going to reign with him, right? Take up your cross. Yeah, take up your cross and follow after me. And so, you know, uh, you know, the problem is here in America, you know, we've had it so good because of how richly God has blessed this land. Like, today when you got up for church, and you know, you got showered, and you got dressed, and you walked out your door, and got in your car on the street or in the driveway, were you looking over your shoulder to, to make sure that your neighbors weren't watching where you were going? Or were you hiding your Bible, you know, in your coat or in your purse, or 
you know, uh, did you uh, take several laps around the block uh, to lose anyone who might, you know, be tailing you before you came into the church parking lot? No, you didn't. But you know what? In China, they're doing things like that. In Muslim countries, they're doing things like that. Oh, absolutely. You know, in China, they're not meeting in open like this. They're meeting in secret. And oftentimes, they don't have whole Bibles. And so what they're doing... They're sharing portions of scripture amongst each other, and then each week they're trading so that this week I can read a different part of the Bible. So which would be best? Oh, absolutely. And then you, you look at uh, you know uh, uh, believers in places uh, you know uh, on the African continent, things like that, mm -hmm. where it's not always necessarily persecution as far as the government, but it, 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 it's a struggle to stay alive because you don't have clean drinking water. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. You know, um, is anybody worried about their next meal in here today? No. You know, some of us are going to leave out of here and either go home because you got something in the crock pot, uh, go home, make some sandwiches. You know, maybe some, you know, uh, I don't have my crew with me today. Ordinarily, we like to go to El Rodeo. Ooh. I can't say rodeo no more. <laughs> it's El Rodeo, right, Barbara? <laughs> yeah. We like to go get some Mexican, you know. And so I can't do that today because I don't have the whole crew with me. But, you know, uh, very few of us are worried about where our next meal is coming from. And watch this. Even if you were here in America, uh, you've got a church here that will help you out. You know, you've got, uh, uh, what do you call them, food pantries mm -hmm. that will help you out. You've got the Salvation Army. You've got Union Mission. Um, so even those who find themselves in that circumstance here in America, there's help that can be found. A lot of countries with uh, around this world, there ain't no soup kitchen to run to. You know, there ain't a, no food pantry. It's a yes. shame that it's the obvious that I beat myself up because I know I'm not going to miss a meal. <laughs> 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 I was going to say the same. Well, I wish I'd lose 20 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I no, say no, that no. after I eat a big meal. <laughs> yeah. What's for lunch? Yeah. Well, well, I got that's what amazed me about Paul, though, when he made that statement in uh, Philippians 3.10. You know, when you were speaking... I just thought of the verse where he says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings yep. being made conformable unto his death. Think yep. about what he says when he says that. Yep. He he his whole life was consumed with with knowing Christ and making Christ known. Amen. But but his idea of knowing Christ is that that he suffer as Christ suffered, mm -hmm. you know. That he did, he he. I mean, and he did. I mean, there were times yeah. when he was near death, and he. But but that's that that verse. That's what I mean. That verse blows me away. Paul oh, amazes me. Yes. Amazes me. Even if, you know, even into his death, you know, he, uh, he was carrying his cross, you know, and uh, right to right to his death, and then he said, uh, "Forgive me." And uh, when he left, he said, uh, I leave now, but I, I, I won't leave us all. He left us to comfort. Yeah. That is awesome. Mm. That's right. Food, all of these things. Well, those the, the requirements that Jesus well, gave for discipleship. Sure. And you said them the three things. You know, you said, take up your cross mm -hmm. and follow me. Now think about it. Denying yourself. Now, how much do we deny ourselves? Mm -hmm. Or at least a lot of people name it. Claim to be Christians, how much do they deny themselves? Take up their cross. What does that imply? They're suffering. You know, you're taking it. It's costing you, and it's costing you a lot. And follow me. And think about think about how many will claim to be Christians, and they don't even know what God's word says. You know, you when you're a disciple, you're a student, a pupil of the teacher. So you're following his teaching. All right, so it says, The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, all of this goes back to God as far as uh, the power that comes from the abiding presence of His Spirit. You know, it's uh, uh, the comforter that dwells within uh, that helps us to have that joy and peace uh, that allows us to abound in hope. All right, uh, verse 14, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. 
Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up to the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now notice the contrast here. Back in verse 8, he points out the fact that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. All right, circumcision, of course, is the Jews. And notice in verse 16 that Paul refers to himself as the minister of Jesus Christ, or on behalf of Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles. And so Jesus, during his earthly ministry, that three and a half years, he ministered primarily to the Jews. <laughs> and then he dies on the cross, he's buried, he rises again, and then he ascends back to the Father. Well, after he ascends back to the Father, what happens next? The Holy Spirit comes. And after the Holy Spirit comes, uh, a, a few chapters after that, Paul gets saved, and then Paul becomes the minister on behalf of Jesus Christ to us Gentiles. And so, um, and this goes right back to, uh, to Paul's conversion itself. Look back at uh, uh, Acts chapter 9. Um, Pastor Eric was referring to uh, Acts 9 this morning. Um, but uh, he didn't uh, mention these verses here, so we'll take a look at them real quick here. Acts chapter 9, I'm watching your time, we've got about five minutes here. Uh, Acts chapter 9, look at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And so... Uh, there's uh, uh, Saul's uh, conversion uh, experience, right? Now, when you come to uh, Acts chapter 26, he gives his testimony of this conversion experience, and he gives us a few details that are not found in chapter 9. Look at verse uh, 13. Verse 13, Acts 26, 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me with them that journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now watch verse 16, because this isn't recorded in Acts 9, but it is recorded here in Acts 26. As uh, Paul Harvey used to say, And now the rest of the story. <laughs> But rise and stand upon thy feet. Jesus still talking. Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. So at the very time God converts Paul, he commissions Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works me. And so Paul, at his very conversion, is commissioned to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Um, notice uh, also Galatians 2. This will be the last one I show you. Come to Galatians 2. In Galatians 2, come to verse uh, 7 and 8. Galatians 2, verse 7 and 8. But contrary, when, uh, or contrary wise rather, contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, 
as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And so uh, there Paul says that he's the apostle of the uncircumcision, the Jews, because that's how God commissioned him. Um, and then Peter was the apostle of the circumcision. Now watch this though. Just like God to try to pull a fast one on us. Now, I'm being facetious. God never tries to pull a fast one. But God does do things to make you think. Cornelius, first Gentile, right? They get saved. Mm-hmm. Who witnessed to him? Who preached to him? Peter. So the first Gentile who gets saved gets saved under the preaching of the apostle to the circumcision. Paul, throughout the book of Acts and all of his missionary journeys, where does he go to every time first? Synagogue. The synagogue. Wait a minute, Paul. I thought you were the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, the gospel's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You remember back in Romans 9 and Romans 10, the burden that Paul had for his own people, his kinsmen, according to the flesh. You know, as he puts it. So, a little bit of irony, don't you think? That the first Gentile gets saved through the preaching of the apostle to the circumcision, <laughs> and the apostle to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles, to you and I, the first place he ever goes, any city he goes to, is the synagogue, where you and I aren't going to be found. <laughs> so, a little bit of irony there. All right, so we'll, we'll take a break there in uh, uh, Romans uh, chapter 15, verse uh, 16, and uh, we'll pick up with uh, verse 17 there next week and uh, hopefully be able to uh, finish out the chapter. Um, any, uh, any questions, uh, any comments, any save rounds? Uh, anybody got anything at all? All right, Carolyn, you came in late, so that means you've got to go watch the video. Uh, there will be a quiz. Uh, I'll email it to your dad. And, uh, you know, your, your privileges will depend on, on your score, right? So, what the, if she doesn't get at least a, what, what do you think, an 80? 80. At least an 80? Yeah. So if you get at least an 80, you, you'll be fine. All right, well, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, being here today. Uh, I'll uh, try to get the email out uh, tomorrow, especially uh, with any of the prayer requests that are on the, uh, uh, the board. Uh, don't forget uh, those that are away from us <coughs> right now. Um, you know, I know Paul and uh, uh, Linda were out of town, and then uh, also uh, Maynard and Emma told me they were going to be gone this week. I can't remember where they said they were going. But, um, and then, of course, uh, you know, uh, keep the Joneses in your prayers, the Kishes. Uh, the Collins, we haven't seen them for a little while. Uh, the Renos, uh, just uh, keep praying for one another. All right, well, let's uh, let's close with uh, prayer. Uh, uh, Mark, would you uh, close us out? Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather to hear the study of your word. And I pray that uh, we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers. Amen. Lord, we live in uh, perilous times. And as a nation, we are especially going through perilous times. We pray for our president, government leaders, and pray for for revival. I pray for government leaders to get saved. Lord, I just pray that uh, we would be seeking to win the lost to let our lives shine. Thank you for the word spoken today. Thank you for John's diligence. Bless each of us, bless our families, and help us to be ready for your soon return. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. No, no, I said you need a. I keep thinking of the Lord.